Yeah, the microphone. There we go. Good morning. Good morning. To see, it's good to see everybody this morning. And uh, before we get into the message this morning, I want to draw your attention to our last two family fun nights of the summer coming up this Wednesday and next Wednesday. This Wednesday is our missions project night. Um, where we're going to put to be putting together some chemo packs uh, and, uh, and, and just praying over those and sending them out with love. Um, and that, that will follow dinner. So make sure you're, you're here for that. And then on the 29th of August, and this is a, 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 a happy announcement, but kind of a sad announcement for some people, uh, it's back to school night. Uh, <laughs> for those of you who are on summer break right now, it's not the best news, but um, back to school night will be on the 29th of August. After dinner, we're going to have um, uh, games and inflatables, and uh, we need volunteers for that, of course, so if you uh, can lend a hand in setting up and, and, and kind of overseeing some of that stuff, supervising, making sure that, you know, kids don't break an arm or anything like that. Um, we would uh, encourage you to, to, to sign up for that. Uh, but a great opportunity uh, to invite your friends, your neighbors um, uh, to, to uh, an event here uh, would be our back to school night. That's on August 29th. Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you be my neighbor? Oh, I just love that graphic. Does it, is, is it bringing back some memories for some of you? Won't you be my neighbor? Back in June of this year, I went with my family to see a beautiful film about an incredible and humble man, Fred Rogers. And, and to be honest with you, I stayed choked up the whole movie. Like you, you know that lump in your throat that won't go away? It just stayed there for the entire like two hours. So a little uncomfortable at the end, but, uh, but a beautiful, beautiful film. And uh, I'm sure that uh, many of you have fond memories of the man who invited us into his neighborhood of make-believe and taught us that kindness could change the world. Every episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood began with the same introductory song, inviting us to play and believe as we learn to be more kind. How many of you remember the song? I'm not going to make you come up and sing it if you remember it. Don't worry about that. How, how many of you remember the song, right? It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly, I bet you didn't even know the second verse, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? You probably know this part. I've always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. Why am I the only one singing? You. <laughs> I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of the key change. Beautiful day. <laughs> Since we're together, we might as well say, would you be mine? Could you be mine? That's it. There you go. But that's not the end of the song. Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be, wow, that was, we need to rehearse that, we need to rehearse that. Um, yes, this is the song that uh, every episode Mr. Rogers would sing and invite us into being his neighbor, being in his neighborhood, and learning really about the kingdom of God. Mr. Rogers may not have come out and said that. But if you know anything about Mr. Rogers, he trained in seminary to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he always felt that, that children, in particular TV with children, was his ministry calling. It was what he was going to do with his life, and he dedicated his life to it. And because of that calling and the answer to that call, uh, so many were blessed and learned about the kingdom of Jesus Christ, even if they didn't realize that they were learning about the kingdom. Very subversive in that way. Well, this morning, we are talking about what it means to be a neighbor and to be neighborly and to love our neighbor as our self. And we're going to look at a passage in Matthew chapter 10. So if you've got your Bibles this morning, I want to invite you to turn there, Matthew chapter 10, and we'll start with verse 5. Matthew 10, starting with verse 5. 
these 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Everybody say sent. Now here are the instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go, everybody say go, go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, proclaim the good news, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in, in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is not worthy, let your peace if, you, if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. Everybody say peace. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your word incarnate in the flesh, Jesus, who was the very embodiment and presence of the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. As your people, as your disciples, we receive this calling to be sent out to proclaim the good news, to be compassionate, to bring healing and comfort, to be generous, to trust. Help us to be people of peace as we answer this call to go. Help us to see Jesus clearly in all these things. Decrease me so that Christ may increase all the more. And it's in his beautiful, wonderful, healing name that we all pray. And God's people said, amen, 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 amen. So the few verses before this passage that we just read, Matthew 10, 1 through 4, is about the 12. We started with the passage, these 12. Well, who are the 12? The 12 are the 12 apostles that Jesus first called to follow him. And they include some doubters, a denier, a tax collector. Everybody say boo. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> a, a tax collector, uh, a couple of mama's boys who were bent towards wrath, and even someone who would betray Jesus. Sounds like the A-team, doesn't it? Sounds like the all-stars. Sounds like the best group of people Jesus could have started with. Because they're not perfect. And eventually they would be sent into an imperfect world to imperfect people to help point them back to the one who is perfect. Amen? Come on, church. Amen? I'm thankful that Jesus uses imperfect people. I'm thankful that Jesus calls those who are broken, those who he know will even betray him, because he wants to invite us into his kingdom, every single one of us. He's inviting us really to be his neighbor. He's inviting us into a loving relationship and to experience the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And he uses imperfect people all the time for this kingdom mission. And there are two aspects to the life of the disciple. There's staying, and there's sending. There's staying, there's abiding in Christ, there's resting in God. There is the security in our identity of whose we are and who we are as the beloved. So there's very much this staying element. 
to the life of the disciple, but there's also the sending, because a disciple is one who is sent. A disciple is one who is on the go, the one who is going, the one who's living life on mission. And so as disciples of Jesus, we are staying We are staying in his presence. We're staying and abiding in Christ, in the love of Christ. We stay connected to him, to the Father, because without that, we can do nothing, right? Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So there's the staying that we need, but there's also this sending where Jesus is sending us, right? Everybody with me? So staying and sending. This is the kind of the two halves of the life of the disciple, and there's a rhythm there. There's times where we abide and stay and rest, and there's our t- there are times when we go and we are sent and we produce and bear fruit. Jesus sent out the 12 under his authority, and so he sends us. He's still sending his disciples to live on mission. How many of you believe that Jesus is still sending people today? Okay, a couple of you. That's, that's a good thing that the rest of you are here. Okay. <laughs> Because by the end of today, we are going to understand that all of us are sent. Every single one of us are sent. We live life on mission for God. In verses 5 through 8 of chapter 10, Jesus begins by sending them out with instructions. Again, this is Jesus leading them, sending them under his authority, the authority that is from the Father, the authority that it establishes and reigns over the kingdom of God. Jesus sends them with this authority and in this authority, right? Um, remember so many times people said um, they were amazed because he taught as one with what? Authority. So Jesus embodies and carries with him the authority of God and the reign of the kingdom in himself. And as he sends he sins in this authority. So he gives them instructions. And, and really, up front, he just says, listen, guys, start with your neighborhood. You want to know where you start? You want to know where you begin? Because I'm sure that these guys were excited. They were pumped. They were ready to, to do work for Jesus. They were ready to follow him anywhere. They wanted to go, and they wanted to, they had seen him do miracles. They wanted to do miracles themselves. They'd seen Jesus heal. They wanted to heal. They've seen Jesus teach in, in ways that, that just blew people's minds with authority from God, and they wanted to be able to do the same thing. They, they, you follow a rabbi so that you can become like your rabbi, and these, these men, they so bad wanted to be able to be like Jesus, so they're excited. And they're probably thinking, where do we begin? Right? When you're so excited to start something, you're so just jazzed up to, to start and to begin, you, you want to ask the question first, well, where do I start? Where do I begin? Some of you are like, I don't need instructions. I don't need a starting point. I see the pieces. I'll put it together on my own. Right? Those are some of you out there that can do that. The rest of us, we want to know a starting point. Where do I begin? What's my first step? So Jesus begins his instructions with the beginning. He says, start in your neighborhood. Don't go to the neighborhoods of the Gentiles where you don't live, those who are in the far reaches in different territories, different regions, and don't go to the places that Samaritans live. It's not because Jesus is against Gentiles or Samaritans because time and time again we see Jesus lifting up, healing embracing, loving the Gentile and the Samaritan. He even uses the Samaritan as the example of what it really looks like to be a neighbor. So Jesus isn't against Gentiles or Samaritans. He wants his disciples to start at home, where you live. Start in your hometown. Start in your neighborhood. Start there. Begin with your neighbors. You see, we have visions of reaching the lost. And oftentimes we fail to see the lost and hurting right next door. Jesus says, start at home. Start in your neighborhood. Start with your neighbors. And in verse verse 6, excuse me, he says, and go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And that word, um, but go rather, it actually literally translates as keep going. Keep going. Jesus says, keep going. 
Look, turn to your neighbor and say, keep going. Don't give up. Don't quit. Keep going. Jesus says, keep going. Keep going to the lost sheep in the house of Israel. Keep going to your neighbors. Don't give up on people. Keep going. It's an ongoing thing. It's active. It's a life living on mission. It's not something we do and finish and we're done with it. It's something we're always doing. Jesus says this, to preach, to proclaim the good news, that is the gospel, and he tells them exactly what the message is. The kingdom of heaven has come near. The kingdom of heaven has come near. There's a lot of things Jesus could have said right there in that message. There's a lot of things he could have said. Hey, I want you guys to include these five bullet points. I want you to get in there. I re- really want you to bring it home. Uh, and, and, and each week, you know, maybe change it up, do a different series, do a different. No, Jesus said the message is clear. It's simple. And it changes everything. The kingdom of heaven has come near. It's the same message that John the Baptist preached. It's the same message that Jesus both preached and embodied. Jesus not only walked the earth to talk and to profess and proclaim that the kingdom of God was near, had come near, had was here on earth as it is in heaven, and it was coming here. It was in the process of coming, and it's already here. Not only did he preach that, But Jesus embodied that. His very presence announced the arrival of the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is sending us to preach and embody this kingdom of good news. Why do you think we are called the body of Christ? Because we are called to not just talk about it, because Christ is the head, amen? But the body embodies the message. What the head proclaims, the body embodies. Are you with me? And so as the church, we are called and gifted and empowered by the Holy Spirit to embody Christ, to embody the presence of God, to embody this kingdom message. And it's a message of good news. Good news. Good news for the brokenhearted. Good news for the sick. Good news for the outcast. Good news for those who are tormented by demons. Good news for even those who are struck by death. It's good news because if it isn't good news for everybody, then it isn't the good news. It's good news. Jesus calls us to be compassionate. He says, listen, the places you go, starting in your neighborhood, you're proclaiming this message, you're preaching this message, but you're also embodying this message. So when you encounter those who are hurting, because you're going to encounter those who are hurting, you're going to encounter those who are sick, you're going to encounter those who are tormented and struggle with demons of their own, you're going you're to encounter people who are feeling lost and confused, you're going to encounter people who have time and time again tasted failure and disappointment, you're going to encounter people who are grieving. You're going to encounter the pain of the world. And when you do, you are embodying the good news that the kingdom of heaven is here and things are changing. Because in the kingdom, God is making all things new. But you have to have compassion. You have to be willing to go to those who are hurting, those who feel lost, those who are suffering. You have to go to them and be compassionate. So we're called to be more compassionate. We're called to be generous. Jesus says, as much as it's been given to you, and in other words, God has been so generous to you, you you ought to live generously. As God shares in your life, you share with other people. Jesus says, follow my example in how I have lived generous to others. Be be compassionate, be generous. And here's another coupling. Earlier we talked about staying and sending. Here's another coupling. Proclamation 
and action. Proclamation and action. Jesus didn't say, hey, go tell everybody, and then you're done. No, he says, go go and bring the power of the kingdom of heaven. Go and heal. Go and cast out, kick out the demons. Call them by name. Bring comfort to those who are hurting. Reach out to those who feel outcast, like outcasts. Jesus calls us not only to proclaim, but to act out and to embody this good news. To proclaim and embody proclamation and action. We are called to embody the gospel. In verses 8 through 10, Jesus takes a moment to, to emphasize with his disciples, listen, trust Trust the Lord. Trust the provision of the one who sends you. Trust that God has you. Trust that the Lord supplies and equips you with everything that you will need for life on mission. Trust him. Right? We, want to, we get excited about going. We find out where we begin. And then we kind of check out because we start getting worried about all the things we haven't worked out, all the details, all, all the things we forgot to get at the store, and all, all the things we forgot to pack, and we, we, we start to get lost in worry, because as soon as, listen, as soon as you get excited about something, as soon as you say yes to God, the enemy comes in and starts to pump in some worry. Hey, why don't you worry about this? Why don't you worry about that? Why don't, why don't you worry about how your bills are getting paid? Why don't you worry about your kid? Why don't you worry about this, um, this upcoming presentation at work? Why don't you worry about all these other things? Why? Because it's a distraction from the call. Jesus says, don't be distracted. Trust. Trust the Lord. Don't even worry about taking anything extra because God has you. Until we let go of control over our worries, we will never go. We've got to let go to go. And then the final verses, 11 through 15, Jesus calls his disciples to seek the hospitality of others. So he, he says, trust the provision of God and seek, depend on. So you're trusting in my provision, right? Now depend on others. <laughs> depend on the hospitality of others. Living on mission means we depend on the Lord's provision and the hospitality of others. We want, to practice, we want to practice hospitality for ourselves, right? Being hospitable people, being welcoming people. And by living this way, we also seek the hospitality of our neighbors. We are looking for people who are receptive and hospitable to the kingdom of God and this message. We are looking for people of peace. That's why Jesus says, use the greeting. Anybody ever wonder what the greeting was? All right, Matthew says, as you enter, enter the house, greet it. Use the greeting. Well, the greeting for generations upon generations of Christ followers, the greeting is, peace be to you. Peace be to you. Why is that the greeting? Because that's the first words from the resurrected Christ, peace. 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 Jesus says, greet them with peace. Peace be to you. And if they receive this peace, then you receive their hospitality. You then place yourselves in their hands, in essence. It's another way of saying, won't you be my neighbor? Right? Peace. Will you be my neighbor? But not everybody will be receptive or hospitable to you or the kingdom, right? Not everybody will be receptive. We don't know who won't be receptive until we what? Greet them with peace. Until we go to them. But Jesus says, hey, listen, if they don't, if they don't receive your peace, if they just throw it back at you, if they're not interested in that, if they are not hospitable to you, Jesus says, don't worry. Don't let that be another worry. Because guess what? You'll get tied up in that worry, and you'll get off track again. Jesus says, don't worry about that. God will take care of all that. Don't worry about that. Shake it off. Keep going. To quote a modern-day poet, haters going to hate, 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 hate. Baby, 
I'm just going to shake, 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 shake. I shake it off. I shake it off. Jesus says, shake it off. Turn to your neighbor and say, shake it off. Turn to your other neighbor and say, shake it off. Don't worry. But you can get bogged down in that. And then that, that, that causes worry and, and anxiety and even fear because then it, it, it immobilizes you, it paralyzes you, and guess what? You won't go to the next neighbor and the next one. You know that, that, that instruction Jesus said to keep going? You won't keep going. You will stay stuck in your worries and in your fears. You will become paralyzed, and the enemy is one. Jesus said, don't worry about that. Don't get caught up in, in, in being angry or resentful or even revenge, you know, vengeful. Don't, don't get caught up in that. I mentioned earlier a couple of his disciples, the mama bo mama's boys, right? James and John, a.k.a. the sons of thunder. Why? Because when, when people didn't receive God, Jesus and the kingdom, they were like, Jesus, let's call down fire on these people, right? They, they, they got really angry, and they were stuck, but Jesus wasn't going to leave them stuck, amen? He, he, he needed them to keep going. You don't worry about that. Don't worry Shake it off. Keep going. I want to read a few verses from that passage again, this time in the message, which is a, a paraphrase of the Scripture, a beautiful paraphrase. And it goes like this. Jesus sent his 12 harvest hands out with this charge. Don't begin by traveling to some far-off place to convert unbelievers. And don't try to be dramatic by tackling some public enemy. Go to the lost, confused people right here in the neighborhood. Tell them that the kingdom is here. Bring health to the sick. Raise the dead. Touch the untouchables. Kick out the demons. You have been treated generously, so live generously. Don't you... Think, don't, you, don't think that you have to put on a fundraising campaign before you start. You don't need a lot of equipment. You are the equipment. I love that. Eugene Peterson is, is, is tapping into what Jesus is saying. Listen, you are. With, with Christ, you are enough. As the Lord sends you, you have what you need because he will provide everything. You don't have to worry about all that other stuff. You are the equipment. Jesus is calling you. There's a senior adult member in our church, a wonderful woman by the name of Betty Glover. And uh, I wanted to just share a little bit of her story this morning. I got to meet with her, uh, visit with her this week. And uh, this isn't the first time she's told me this, but it just, of course, it hit me like a ton of bricks based on the passage that we were in this week. You know, Betty wanted so badly to be a missionary when she was a little girl. She, she heard stories about foreign missionaries, and she so badly wanted to be one. But she felt like there were some physical health issues that she had that would not let her, would not it would prevent her from actually being able to step into that. So she always said, I, I wasn't called, although I wanted, I wanted to be a missionary. So Betty said, and this is a direct quote, I decided I would do what I could do. I decided I would do what I could do. So where do you begin? Where do you start? She started serving with the visitation ministry here. Visiting prospects, visiting new members, visiting young families, visiting even nursing homes. She began there with just visiting people. Then she started her own greeting card ministry, which she says was in part competition with Bobby Ray. But she started this greeting card ministry where she was sending cards to like everybody. Then she started a gift bag ministry. If the cards weren't enough, it was, how much more can I give? How much more can I do? So she started a gift bag ministry. 
And I'm hearing her say all this, and then she explains why she got into those three areas. And I just, I, I almost chuckled in front of her, but, but I definitely smiled. She said she started doing these things because she liked to talk, she liked cards, and she loved shopping. <laughs> she does like to talk. She likes cards, and she loves shopping. She just took, listen, she took the things that she loved and was passionate about, and she embodied the gospel through those things. Again, she said, I decided I would do what I could do. So she took the things she enjoyed doing, and she embodied the gospel with those things. And she continues to embody the gospel through those things. How many of you have ever received a card or a gift bag from Betty? Raise your hand, right? Listen, Betty Glover is a missionary. Betty Glover is a missionary. She has lived a life on mission simply because she decided she would do what she could do. And she used the things that she already liked to embody the good news of Jesus. And so can you. So can I. So what's holding us back? What's holding us back? In an interview for the New York Times, Fred Rogers was asked, the worst thing is people seem afraid to talk to each other. Why is that? Why are people, why does it seem people are afraid to talk to each other? And Mr. Rogers responded, perhaps we think that we won't find another human being inside that person. Perhaps we think that there are some people in this world who I can't ever communicate with And so I'll just give up before I try. And how sad it is to think that we would give up on another person who's just like us. Don't give up before you try. Don't give up before you try. Keep going. Keep going. Pass the peace on. Love your neighbor as yourself. Don't be afraid. Keep going. Embody the gospel, the kingdom of God, which is close and is good news for everyone. Amen. Amen. We're going to respond now, singing a hymn of response. I am thine, O Lord. I'll be down front to pray with anybody, receive anybody. But the invitation this morning is clear. Jesus says, will you go? Will you love your neighbor? Start At home, start in your neighborhood. Go as I am sending you. So the response this morning can simply be, here I am, Lord. Send me. I'll go. I'm not going to give up on people, especially not before I try. I'm not going to let worries hold me back or concerns or even fears. I'm going to keep going because I'm going as you are sending. Let's stand together and sing our hymn of response. Let's respond to this call this morning to be his disciples.